This will be uh, a primer of some of the essential anatomical structures and kind of the layout that the lumbopelvic region offers in regard to large nerves and uh, large uh, blood vessels. So we'll start off and uh, look at just some of the very simple uh, anatomical concepts of the lumbopelvic region and specifically lumbosacral region and start off with uh, the lumbar vertebra. So if you look at the lateral surface of this lumbar vertebra, some of the things that uh, will stand out is that the anterior height, at least in the lower lumbar vertebra, tends to be a little higher than the posterior height. You'll notice that the uh, articular facets superior uh, are going to face posterior and medial, right? So that puts our plane in the sagittal plane as far as those facet joints are concerned. Uh, interestingly, in looking at this view, the lateral um, position here is of the um, facet joint um, articulating. This is actually for a uh, uh, rib, so this is misleading as a lumbar vertebra, but as the uh, 12th uh, vertebra is very uh, similar to the lumbar vertebra. This is your lateral articular facet, and as we mentioned, the facet planes in the sagittal plane. Looking at a bird's eye view of uh, a lumbar vertebra, this uh, shows you the vertebral canal, and you'll see that the transverse diameter is greater than the AP diameter. And you get a whole host of uh, different experiences as far as where the pedicles are in relationship to uh, posterior approaches. Um, especially as you descend, you'll see a gradient of about 15 to 30 degrees, um, again, depending on the vertebral level. And uh, a nice uh, landmark uh, website is uh, actually at aofoundation.org. Uh, you should go there and see all the beautiful material they have. And they'll point out to you these four structures if you're trying to highlight areas uh, specific for where the pedicles are, if you're interested in doing pedicle screws, uh, and for the lumbar region. So the highlighted areas are the pars interarticularis, which we see about right here. Mammillary process, <clears throat> which is here, just at the base uh, junction between your superior articular uh, facet and the base of the TP transverse process. The lateral border of the uh, superior articular facet, and then the transverse process itself. So the lower image from the AO site, uh, which you can visit and see a higher definition image, shows you uh, how to construct different lines, horizontal, uh, vertical, etc. And depending on surgeon preference uh, and level, you can guide yourself to the premier site uh, for pedicle screw insertion. And uh, taking all those uh, measurements and lines uh, together, the idea is that your uh, pedicle screw for uh, trauma in this region would enter somewhere in this region and would guide itself along the pedicle and then end up here in all of this nice uh, bone found within the body. So very basic uh, ideas. The dorsum of the sacrum, which uh, most of you uh, would be familiar with, uh, remember has uh, articular facets here that pay face posteriorly and articulate with the inferior articular facets of L5. We have a, a dilated ala. And remember that the spinous processes here uh, in the midline are going to fuse to form a median sacral crest. And then if that's opened up inferiorly as the sacral hiatus where the anesthesiologist can access uh, for uh, caudal anesthesia. And also make sure you remember that the caudal most uh, termination of the subarachnoid space is at S2, right? So uh, approximately here. You notice that the foramina that we're looking at posteriorly are the posterior sacral foramina. So these are carrying out uh, only part of what would be included in our intervertebral foramen at a uh, more superior level. So posterior rami and the nerves that come out of these posterior rami uh, are only going to those deep back muscles around the spine, the paraspinal muscles. They go to the facet joint and then they end in the skin over the back. This is a bird's eye view. Shows you uh, the uh, forward projection of the Oh, okay, thanks. Thank you. The forward projection, the sacral promontory, 
And then we see our huge uh, lateral extensions, the a lug, which are wonderful for getting uh, screws in and holding on to a uh, good purchase bone. We see our median sacral crest, as I mentioned, and then our posterior facing uh, superior articular facets. A little cut down shows you basically the side of the intervertebral foramen of the sacrum, right? And then we see that it's se separated into posterior and anterior sacral foramina. Uh, the anterior sacral foramen are going to have the much larger ventral rami of uh, the sacral spinal nerves, S1, S2, S3 in particular, and the major outflow of those sacral nerves is out into your sciatic nerve. Just a, a reminder of how the articulation exists between the sacrum and the ilium. You'll see that posteriorly it's where we have uh, a tuberosity. This is the matching side of the sacrum. And then our articular surface is here with the sacrum, so more anterior. So screws that are in the tuber uh, tuberosity portion of the um, back of the articulation are going to avoid that art um, articular surface. Very generic view as we start to go through and look at some of the nerves and uh, arteries in this area. You'll see that this is a typical lumbar vertebra. Let's assume this is a L5, or well, it's not L5, but let's assume so. We see a thickened uh, thoracolumbar fascia. Remember, the transversus abdominis comes down and splits into this posterior lamina that attaches to your spinous process, right? So with a midline spinous or spinal uh, exposure, you're going through that posterior lamina of the thoracolumbar fascia. We then have a, a middle layer that attaches onto the TP, or the transverse process. And then a very thin uh, anterior layer that runs in front of this muscle. Who knows what this muscle is? Quadratus lumborum. So quadratus lumborum that uh, essentially runs between the iliac crest and the 12th rib. So both attaching onto the TP. So in cross-section, some uh, landmarks. This is the psoas major muscle. This would represent your <laughs> deep native back muscles, the erector spiny muscle, the multifidus muscles, for example. So anyway, just highlights. Uh, for the neural uh, projection of the way the nerves are going to enter those uh, posterior lumbosacral segments, there's the spinal cord. So this is an anterior view with our dorsal rootlets, ventral rootlets. Remember, they're segregated at that point into just motor and sensory fibers. There's your dorsal root ganglion that's uh, in this uh, peri intervertebral foramen region. We have a dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus. So we'll focus on the dorsal ramus, which carries both a mixture of uh, sensory and motor fibers, right? So that dorsal rami, as I mentioned before, is going to innervate the facet joints in the lumbosacral uh, region. It's going to innervate the native muscles in this region, so the erector spiny, multifidus. And then, as I mentioned, it ends as a cutaneous branch with medial and lateral components that go out and uh, innervate the skin of the back. If we look at a, a posterior exposure of the lumbosacral region, and we've removed the posterior elements, so we're looking at the pedicles. Right, these are the cut ends of the pedicles. Here's the intervertebral disc. Here's the top of the sacrum with its superior articular facets. And then the fecal sac is uh, shown very nicely. So we see the dural nerve uh, sheaths that are uh, covering up the spinal nerve and portions of the dorsal root ganglia. You can see the ganglia and the lumbar uh, sacral region are really uh, just inferior to those pedicles on cut. You'll see that the fecal sac ends here, right, at about S2. And then we have little nerve sheaths that follow out those uh, spinal branches. You can see the dorsal rami are very small, right? They just go to those three structures so that they don't have to be too large. Versus the ventral rami that are entering the ventral foramen of the sacrum are much larger. And as we said earlier, are going to go out to contribute primarily to the sciatic nerve, but also uh, larger nerves, for example, the pudendal nerve. This is more of a, a cartoon picture, but shows you if we did a, a cross-section through that same area. This is uh, our fecal sac, 
we see uh, we're coming to the end of the spinal cord, so we could call that the, the conus medullaris. So this has to be about L1 or L2 uh, vertebral level. We have epidural fat, and then this all represents the cauda equina. And as the cauda equina comes down, it will start to have its uh, representative fibers leave, right? So these are rootlets, both uh, dorsal and ventral. And then they come out as uh, dorsal and ventral rootlets. Here's the actual spinal nerve, which is just a few millimeters in length and resides here in the intervertebral foramen region. Here's our uh, dorsal ramus, again, much smaller and kind of crossing over uh, the superior aspect of our TP. Here's our uh, ventral ramus, much larger. And remember that the ventral rami in the body, uh, except for most of the thoracic spinal nerves, those ventral rami go out and then interdigitate with other ventral rami to form plexuses. Okay. This is uh, that same anatomy at the sacral uh, level. So we see uh, the sacral anterior body. Here's the median sacral crest. Here's our ala, and this is a, a nice depiction for landmarks if you're putting in hardware into the back of the sacrum, uh, how to avoid some of the uh, neural structures. Here's the DRG that sits uh, more or less uh, intraosseously. Here's our anterior and ventral, excuse me, anterior and posterior roots, and then coming out into our ventral and dorsal rami. You can see those same uh, structures if you uh, put some of the uh, bone back and we see articular facets, right, or facet joints that have been disarticulated. You get a hint of where the DRGs are lying here in the lumbar region. And then here the dorsal fecal sac is open and you can see the cauda equina with the exiting uh, nerve roots and uh, their DRG and spinal nerves and where they rest with one another. So when those dorsal rami terminate into the back uh, skin, in the lumbosacral region, you'll see that they come out something of this nature. And remember, uh, at this point, these are branches that are only going to the skin. Uh, if you remember, each of those dorsal rami had a medial and lateral branch that goes to the skin. And if you kind of split the back into an upper half, right, so here in a lower half, in the upper half, uh, the medial branches are going to become cutaneous, whereas in the lower half, uh, the lateral branches are becoming cutaneous. Some of these lateral branches that you'll see are going to come out and cross over the iliac crest. Uh, and uh, for branches that come from the lumbar region, those are called superior cluneal nerves, right? And those can be injured when you're uh, removing parts of the iliac crest to use for uh, bone um, fusion procedures. Uh, we can have some coming from the sacrum. These are the middle cluneals. And then uh, just for good measure, those are the inferior cluneals that come up below uh, the uh, gluteus maximus muscle. So adding some more nerves, we'll look at the front of the vertebral um, sacral junction region. This is uh, the top of the iliac crest. And just to orient you, this is the quadratus lumborum. Remember that runs from the iliac crest to the 12th rib. We then see the uh, oblique muscles that are coming in and fusing in and around that quadratus lumborum, iliacus. And here's our psoas major. So the lumbar region, uh, and in particular uh, L1 through L4, gives rise to the so-called lumbar plexus, right? And that lumbar plexus, those fibers, either run through or behind the psoas major. So these are branches of the lumbar plexus. Uh, some of these are kind of uh, minor players. They innervate some muscle, some skin, but some are major players. For example, the femoral nerve, obturator nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So if we name these branches, uh, this is the subcostal nerve, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, lateral femoral cutaneous, femoral, which is a big player, lateral femoral cutaneous. We see uh, the genital femoral piercing the psoas major, and then not such a, a good view of the obturator nerve, which would lie down here, just medial to the psoas major. So each of those branches uh, are going to supply some uh, area of uh, muscle, right? Some of them, for example, these upper fibers only innervate a little bit 
of the muscles that we call the uh, oblique muscles, uh, then some will innervate major muscle groups. For example, the femoral nerve innervating your quadriceps and many of your other anterior thigh muscles. You'll see that, uh, just for good uh, reference, that the uh, lumbar plexus is out mostly lateral to the psoas major. And then in a peri-aortic uh, location, and then going right across our lumbo-pelvic junction posteriorly, is our uh, pre-aortic plexus. And that pre-aortic plexus is uh, almost exclusively sympathetic fibers. They're heading down uh, past the bifurcation of the aorta to become the superior hypogastric plexus. Right, so sympathetics, uh, some now and in antiquity, the superior hypogastric plexus would be lesion for uh, chronic pelvic pain syndromes, uh, cancer, for example. Now, those superior hypogastric plexus will come down, and here in the pelvis, which I'll show you in another slide, will interdigitate with uh, pelvic splanchnics. These are parasympathetics coming from S2, 3, and 4. And once they will fuse together with the superior plexus, they form the inferior hypogastric plexus that essentially supplies sympathetics and parasympathetics to your pelvic viscera. Just another uh, snapshot of the anterior uh, lumbovertebral uh, region, lumbopelvic region, and we see some of those same uh, autonomic fibers. And just to draw your attention to the sympathetic chain that's running here uh, in a para-aortic location, and based in the thorax where this parasympathetic chain is back where the ribs attach to the thoracic vertebra, down in the lumbar region, the chain moves up more anteriorly, so it's running on the anterior surface of the uh, vertebral bodies, just lateral uh, to the aorta and uh, the inferior vena cava that's not shown here. So this is a lumbopelvic uh, junction. You see L5 and S1. Remember, our dural sac would end about, our subarachnoid space would end here. We look up at the bifurcation of the great vessels. Here's the aorta, inferior vena cava, uh, and you'll see it's splitting. So cut here would be the uh, right-sided common iliac. Here's the left common iliac. These are about five centimeters long. You have a comparably sized uh, common iliac veins. And then after about five centimeters, they split into the external and internal Iliacs. The external, as you all know, goes on out and becomes the femoral vasculature, artery-wise. The internal iliac stays inside, more or less, and supplies the pelvic uh, viscera. There are a few exceptions. For example, the obturator artery will go out and innervate or give blood supply to your obturator musculature. Um, also gives a little vessel that goes to the hip joint, which you're all familiar with. Now, we mentioned that the main output of the sacral plexus, remember um, that our lumbar plexus is L1 to L4, so our sacral plexus is about a little late L4 and all the way down to S3. And the main output of that is the sciatic nerve. So the sciatic nerve uh, is the main output of the um, combined lumbosacral plexus leads through the greater sciatic foramen. And you all know, uh, being orthopedists, that most of that greater sciatic foramen is filled in with the piriformis muscle. So it occupies the region. And in most people, the sciatic nerve will come out below that uh, piriformis muscle uh, and then descend down somewhere uh, halfway between the ischial tuberosity and the greater trochanter. This is our uh, sacroiliac um, joint that's covered over with some large ligaments. We see posteriorly one extension is the um, sacrotuberous ligament, and then there's a sacrospinous ligament that's a little more anterior. And we know that when those two come together, they help form a greater and lesser sciatic foramina. And other than the sciatic nerve that comes out here under piriformis, if you peeled away the sacrotuberous ligament, you'd find another nerve that runs just deep to that, and that's the pudendal nerve. So from S2, 3, and 4, sandwiched between those two uh, ligaments here from a posterior view. Uh, so major players in the uh, vasculature artery-wise of the um, lumbopelvic region. Here's the aorta. We said that it uh, will usually bifurcate at about L4, which is essentially a line drawn through the tips of 
of the iliac crest, the highest points, and that's called the um, transcrystal, intercrystal, supracrystal plane. You uh, hear a lot of different terms used for it, but it marks about L4, uh, L5. Uh, so anteriorly, that's where the aorta will split. Uh, it's also a good landmark for deciding where your um, L4, 5 uh, spinous process will be posteriorly. Some of the major uh, vessels that come off will not worry about the proximal vessels, but inferiorly in, um, in the back, we see these segmental branches. So these are the lumbar arteries that come off and run through the intervertebral foramina, will supply the nerve at that level, will come posteriorly and go all the way back to the native uh, muscles that are in the paraspinal region. Uh, running uh, just anteriorly is the median sacral artery and it'll often give off our fifth uh, lumbar vessels as we see here. Um, those can also be uh, reinforced by uh, the lumbar branch of the iliolumbar artery, which is here. And this iliolumbar artery is uh, usually the first branch of the internal iliac. So some uh, large players here. You'll remember that the aortic bifurcation is slightly shifted to the left side, and that makes way for the inferior vena cava which we see here, which usually has uh, a bifurcation at about L5, so a little bit lower. It's uh, shifted to the right side. Um, if we look at our supercrystal plane, it would be just here. Uh, it has some comparable vessels, so median sacral vein anteriorly. Uh, we have some lateral sacral branches uh, that come out of the anterior uh, sacral foramina of the sacrum with uh, S1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, we'll also note that uh, one peculiar vessel is this iliolumbar vein that some of the segmental vessels drain into, but also collects uh, an iliac branch over the iliac crest and iliacus muscle uh, deep to the psoas major. And uh, this will have a confluence into the iliolumbar vein that runs here uh, just on the lateral surface of the um, lumbar spine. So when these vessels, arteries, come off of the aorta, they run posteriorly. Uh, and then uh, we have some uh, big players that will go inside and give uh, branches to the spinal cord. We have smaller players that you're more likely to encounter with posterior approaches that are these dorsal branches that cross over. They give multiple little uh, periosteal and intraosseous branches that supply the bone itself. Uh, some soft tissue, for example, branches that will run inside and supply the ligaments, uh, for example, the ligament and flavum, posterior longitudinal ligament. And then these will end out here as they come up to the paraspinal musculature, et cetera. So those are the ones you're more likely to see uh, when you're doing posterior uh, trauma to the spine. This is a little uh, additional image that shows you um, as after the aorta, these are the branches you see posteriorly. Uh, some of these uh, that you have to remember can be very important. So there's a large artery uh, of a Damkowitz that is a major player in blood supply to the uh, lower part of the spinal cord. You have to always keep in the back of your mind that he arises, he or she arises uh, from one of these uh, inner segmental branches. And that can happen anywhere between T8 and L2. There's a bell-shaped curve. Um, most of these come off around T12. So uh, at the thoracolumbar junction, a little uh, more superior than where we are, you can uh, find this major vessel. It usually comes off on the left side. Um, so just uh, something to remember as the anterior longitudinal, not anterior longitudinal, anterior spinal artery doesn't really have enough uh, umph to it to supply the whole anterior surface of the spinal cord, so it's reinforced by this segmental vessel. Just to show you some of the complexity, we'll not get into it, but the internal iliac here at the lumbopelvic junction uh, is said to be one of the most variable blood vessels in the whole body. So every single cadaver I look in or others look in, there's a different configuration. You look for basically where these vessels go to, not where they come from because they're so variable. Um, but they come off, there are multiple branches. There can be fewer branches in some folks, uh, more in others. And as I said earlier, most of these go out and supply the viscera, so the prostate, the urinary bladder, the rectum, uterus. Some will leave the pelvis, like the obturator artery. Here's a better view of the obturator nerve from L2, 3, and 4 that uh, 
we didn't see earlier. Uh, some of these branches will enter the sacrum, right? So these lateral sacral branches uh, that come off of the um, back of the iliolumbar region, the iliolumbar artery itself, will enter the ventral foramina and then supply those nerve roots and actually give rise to those segmental vessels that I showed you on the earlier slide and help supply the vessels and they can actually uh, rise up and give some uh, uh, arterial supply to the cord itself. Uh, just a very schematic picture that shows you the relationship of the common iliac uh, to the junction here of the lumbopelvic region, uh, the relationship of the internal iliac this is our iliolumbar artery, uh, which is one of the few branches off of the iliac system that ascends uh, retrogradely and crosses that uh, lumbosacral region to come back up and uh, can potentially be encountered with posterior approaches that go a little more anterior than normal. 